Um, yeah, so my name's Daniel Stone. Um, I am one of the, the people behind freedesktop.org. Um, free Desktop's one of the, the harder organizations to describe, I think. Um, you guys have got a, a much easier job. Um, we're, we're a pretty loose umbrella of sort of core foundational um, open source projects all aimed at the Linux desktop in particular. Um, so we kind of, I should probably actually be sat in the middle um, because yeah, we, <laughs> we started um, out of between the GNOME and KDE projects, which you'll hear in a sec, um, as a way for GNOME and KDE to, to collaborate on common desktop technology um, from everything like how should drag and drop work through to uh, network management. And now, as you can see from some of the, the projects there, a lot of our focus is on uh, graphics and multimedia as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm one of the people behind Free Desktop. I've been there approximately 15 years. Um, and I spearheaded and pushed forward our move to, to GitLab, which is why I'm sat here. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm Carlos Soriano. I'm one of the directors in the Non Foundation. And I have been there as a director for three years and in the Non Project for about uh, seven years now. And I was leading the initiative to switch Non from what we had before to the GitLab, um, from all the tooling that we have before to GitLab. And um, so the Non Project is a um, free software project. And what we do is that we deliver the main goal is to deliver a free software desktop for the Linux. But the non project is not only that, it's also a place for innovation. Like we have tools that was, was born in the non project, such as Mono. Do you know Mono, for example? Can you raise your hand, those that know Mono? Oh, OK, yeah, that's great. So yeah, we created no, uh, Mono. <laughs> we also uh, did GStreamer and also, for example, Systemd, that probably you know. And so. So yeah, I'm basically sitting here uh, just because I'm representing NOM and I led the initiative to switch to GitLab. Oops. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm uh, Paul Brown and I am a communications officer for KDE. We also have a flagship uh, project which is a graphical desktop that you can see here. Uh, again, for Linux and for other free operating systems, it works, for example, on uh, FreeBSD and so on. But it, again, it's, it's not only a desktop, we also create lots of applications that don't, uh, that uh, of all initially work on, on Plasma, but also work on GNOME, thanks, thanks to the work of the Free Desktop yeah, thank you, uh, organization, and also on other uh, platforms. So uh, our, some of our most popular applications like Crit and KD Live, et cetera, work on Windows and Mac, and even on Android, they are being ported to Android and stuff like that. So it's not only uh, Linux desktop what we're talking about, um, we're also talking about all the applications around that. We have uh, a, a list in, uh, on our website. That these, uh, the core applications, there are 242 applications. There are more, but these are the core ones that we distribute every uh, three months, four months, I think, something like that. And, and, and yeah, and the same way as uh, we also create stuff that works uh, on the back end, for example. Uh, if you use any form of uh, uh, browser that uses WebKit or, or uses the descendant of WebKit, uh, Chrome or uh, Safari or anything like that, WebKit came from HTML, which was developed by KD. Uh, so it, it, we do stuff that then it finds it way, its way into other projects, even if they are not open source. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the background. And I guess my first question, I'll, I'll start with you, Carlos, because you started on this journey before the other two communities. I mean, what, when you were evaluating new tools uh, or new workflow, I mean, what were your requirements, like tooling-wise and, and workflow-wise, and what were some of the requirements that, you were, that, were, that, that were important to you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think the, uh, the foremost uh, requirement that we have is that the tooling must be free software. So that's something that uh, the non-foundation is very root on their values, uh, the same for the non-project. So that was the first thing. And so things like GitHub, 
they are out of question. And so, you know, we have other tools such as uh, Fabricator, Baxilla, and all of that that, you know, were part of the investigation and research on what's the best tooling for, for now. So I think the main factors that we had to choose GitLab was that we were really looking towards a single workflow. So before we had like Baxilla, we had Sigit, we have, you know, a mailing list, we have a lot of different tooling, and that's really hard for new people. And that's something that, for example, GitHub and GitLab did very well, and especially GitLab. Uh, so when we were choosing the tooling, we were looking at that and how newcomer friendly they are, if they have a powerful CI, because we don't have CI either. So all of that was very important for us. And before when I said that free software, that the tool must be free software, I don't mean only to have the code available and be open source. For us, it's very important that the company and the people behind the project are very committed to that because that really creates a sustainable project and that really builds uh, trust because the non project has been uh, now 22 years old. So you cannot rely on something that, you know, <laughs> is proprietary and can change in three years. You really need free software there. Uh, there. Um, so yeah, I think that's, those were the main factors that we have to choose GitLab and I think so far we are quite happy uh, with it. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and I mean, just to add some background, I mean, we have an open source pro I mean, open source program at GitLab, and so any open source projects can apply uh, to get free access to ultimate or goal licenses, of, uh, uh, goal licenses of GitLab, and plus like a substantial discount on on support. But these three communities are, I mean, they're using like a true free edition with mm -hmm. community edition. Uh, so next question, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, I mean, you, you were sort of the second in the group of, you know, moving to GitLab. I mean, what, and then I think you told me last night you were asking a lot of questions to Carlos about their experience. And what were some of the questions that you were asking and what were some of your, like, key concerns? Um, yeah, so we, we came through a, li a little bit after GNOME, probably about a year after you guys. Um, I, I was actually brought in as part of the, the GNOME um, decision-making process to, to argue the case for Fabricator, and you know, I've ended up here, so <laughs> it's all got a bit out of hand. Um, yeah, I, I think really though our, our key consideration was the same, like that, um, that real commitment to not just having the source open, but to having an open development process mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, free desktop, one of its uh, its strands where all the, the graphical side came from is, um, it's got its roots in a failed vendor consortium. Um, and then we later sort of fled and set up home as at free desktop as a true neutral venue. So for us, it was super, super important to, um, to make sure that the development process was open and transparent, um, something we could see and uh, and get involved in as well. So, looking at some other uh, projects, you know, either the decision making and the roadmap was completely opaque, um, and that wasn't something we were we were comfortable with in terms of having our foundational infrastructure depend on it, or it was a one person show, or it was pay for play. So. Yeah, it, would, it was really important that you know GitLab sort of properly embraced openness because that's super compatible with us as a project. Cool. All right, and uh, next question, I'll uh, throw this to you, Paul. I mean, I mean, I think your community uh, started probably like early this year in earnest, like doing proof of concept type yeah. of things. Like, what were some of the, I mean, key elements that you're looking at? Uh, when you're evaluating different tools? Well, uh, uh, I could say what they said. <laughs> so I'll add something to that. Uh, there was uh, also the fact that we could host our own instance. This was very important. Everything has to be hosted on, uh, and I think it's the same with no one. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it has but, uh, open source, um, uh, no, free software projects uh, have to be able to control all the aspects of uh, the machines they they use for the servers and so on and so uh, this sort of uh, this ruled out our our alternatives. Um, we have uh, currently a bit of a mishmash because uh, in free software projects, what you, what happens, especially free software projects that are all, are as old as ours, uh, 22 years. Uh, KD is 25 or 26 this year. I think it's next week or something like that. So that you've got a lot of legacy uh, frameworks and workflows and so on. 
So uh, we cannot say that we're going to migrate totally to GitLab because we have to figure out how to move all that and that's gonna take some time. Um, and some workflows rely on really old scripts and things that uh, uh, have to be changed over. Um, uh, but uh, everybody agreed that it was, it was a move that we had to do because it was, a, uh, as it is, it's a bit, uh, free software projects normally don't develop, they just grow, you know, like tumors and things like that. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> It's true, so you, you, uh, people come in and, and uh, bring in their scripts and bring in their workflow and something that, that is uh, uh, a temporary fix becomes permanent and you were talking about something that you discovered a temporary fix from 1999. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they have something like that. So, so <laughs> you know, uh, you find the comment, this is only a temporary fix. Yeah, okay, it's, you know, t uh, 20 years later. Um, so uh, we, we have to, we were using, uh, we introduced Fabricator, I think it's four years ago, and that hasn't worked out too well for us because there's very few people who are, who are supporting that, and we needed something that could be supported by, by a consistent company, and also the process uh, by which uh, new contributors uh, can come in and submit code is difficult with Fabricator because it's not familiar. Um, most people know how to use this fork and then submit uh, uh, a request to, and this is something that Fabricator doesn't do. They, there's these series of hoops you have to jump through that, uh, uh, that kind of defeat the purpose of having a, a graphical interface Anyway, so you, I mean, if you have to use commands that are uh, command line git, why would you have a graphical interface at all? So Fabricator was that. And uh, it, we were finding one of, one of, uh, one of the, the push, uh, the, 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 the groups that were most pushing for a change was the outreach uh, group, which want to grow the community. And they were finding that a lot of people who are coming in were finding big difficulties in, in contributing back to, to KD. So we looked for something that people would be familiar with, and that was uh, GitLab. And uh, we're implementing it so that we can also, it's, it's not only the technical, you know, the, the continuous integration and all these, and all these interesting tools that you have, but also because it's familiar, it's usable, and so on. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to be at uh, KD Academy a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and I mean, it's KD Academy is our annual conference where all the uh, community members get together. And I knew there was going to be a session on GitLab. I knew it was a, a popular topic, but it was actually led by a person like Paul was saying, who's in charge of like outreach and, and community growth. And I was pretty impressed. I mean, the, within that context, the tool, uh, tooling was being discussed. Um, so, I mean, next question, and this is uh, somewhat near and dear to my heart. I've, I've been a community manager for a couple different projects. Uh, there are very few topics uh, like tools that incite excitement among community members, right? I mean, if you want to start a d lively discussion at a pub, uh, I think one of the good topic is tools. Uh, I, I mean, Carlos, so who are some of the stakeholders that you had to work with or, or talk to in terms of making a tooling decision like a few years ago? Yeah, so this is something that I, uh, is really hard. It's really hard to bring consensus in a community like NOM, uh, Kadi, and um, uh, Free Desktop. So how we did it? So first we contact uh, GitLab and we wanted to know how much support we can have from them because it's very important for us that we can have the support because a community, you know, members of the community go and, go and, and, and come. So you need something that, you know, is stable and, and so they bring support to you. And so first we talk with them, we see the possibilities that are there. And then what, what they did is to bring some key contributors on the community. And then uh, we were like six people, but they knew they were key contributors. So they knew, I knew they, they have influence on the community, right? 
So we were discussing options, and then uh, when I started, I, I wanted to bring a fabricator, actually. I was not a GitLab <laughs> fan myself. Uh, but we started the, the conversation and, you know, just uh, discussing and everything, and then we agreed on GitLab. And just to make sure, I tried to bring people from outside of Gnome that were not uh, GitLab fans. And I broke him. I invite him, like, hey, can you come to our discussion? That was back in, like, GitLab 8, I think, 8 point something? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. so. Yeah, like two that years. That looks so a lot different now. Yeah, two <laughs> years ago, yeah. And so I think that was very important, and it was very interesting because I bring him as a fabricator uh, fan, other people that were using Baxilla, whatever, and at the end of the, of the meetings that we had over a month, we all agreed that GitLab was the solution, <laughs> not only for non, but for other projects. Um, so yeah, so once we had that, what we did is uh, work with other people in the community to create some uh, wiki page where we put all, all the considerations that we had. And so we presented that to the community. Uh, we presented the investigation, we presented the research, and then we tried to gather feedback. And that's the most important part when you present an, an initiative like this, is to gather feedback and make sure that you have some consensus, even though it's really hard to know whether there is consensus happening. So we did that over uh, three months. Uh, I got the feedback, I come back to GitLab, we talk how to address that feedback, and then back and forth, I consult the board as well, the, the, board, for, the board from the non-foundation, and we agree that GitLab is the right solution. And then once I consider that I think personally <laughs> that we have an agreement, uh, then I just uh, move forward with that and I set a deadline that if nothing important comes, we will switch to GitLab. And so that's how I did it. There are multiple ways to do it, and I don't think someone has the right way. It's just trying your community and see what works best. Mm. So, I mean, next question I'll ask you, Daniel. I mean, what, so I, 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 one of the things I read, like you published a blog post, I think, when you, when you made, made an announcement about uh, switching to GitLab. Uh, I mean, what's been the feedback from the community? Uh, I think like one of the areas that you were concerned about was like particularly like a CI capability, but I mean, good or bad, like what were some of the early feedback that you got from the community members? Yeah, um, I mean, we do have like actual kernel development as well as projects which are adjacent to the kernel going on. So it, it was a pretty drastic change given that we're literally just emailing around patches and like, people will shout at you if you use HTML mail or go over 72 characters. So like, it, it was a pretty big move for us, but um, I think what you were saying about the the outreach in KDE was pretty relevant for us. Like, um, we've always been starved of contributors. Um, you know, all of us are sort of doing five different things at the same time. Um, and then, yeah, we, we were sat around wondering why we didn't have more contributors when <laughs> we had the world's most arcane contribution processes. Um, so a big thing, like, CI has been really, really helpful in, you know, getting people from mildly on board to, you know, rabid enthusiasts, but the biggest thing for us by far was just relentlessly uh, lowering the barrier to entry. So even just things like um, pretty much none of the, the projects that we had had contributing files <laughs> until we moved to GitLab, and then right. there was this nice prompt saying, you should add a uh, contributing.md. So, oh yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Maybe if we told people how to approach uh, contribution to our project and you know what they could expect as well once they'd done it, maybe if we did that, then we wouldn't see so many people either never turn up or just leave immediately. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that struck me from your blog post, I mean, it was, I, mean, I recommend people to read it. I mean, I think it's foolishbar.org. That's one. Uh, and I mean, it was very, very detailed, and you even touched on, like, governance. Like, you're hoping that governance would improve. Like, how does a tool selection, like, Im have impact on, on governance in the community? Um, I guess one of the, the bigger things with um, governance is, Everything was was blocking on us. Was funneled through the the admin team. Um, I use the word team loosely. It's mostly just me, um, <laughs> as yeah, yeah, as is common in open source, right? Yeah. Um, but so things like adding new accounts and um, changing permissions, um, setting up Git hooks for people to you know mail out commit notifications or whatever, like all of that 
had to be funneled through us because me, because <laughs> there was um, just no way to, to segregate and delegate that properly. So one of the things that's been really nice is um, yeah, having the ability for, for anyone to sign up, but then projects as well to, to decide, you know, if someone wants to um, have commit access, like fine, you just give it to them, we don't care anymore. Um, so it's, I think, definitely improved things in the sense that it's allowed all of the, the member projects, because we've got around a bit over 100 member projects, I think. It's allowed them to get a little bit more loose and freeform, which I think has been really good for them. Um, but then it's also given us more time to <laughs> to do things which aren't, you know, creating accounts in LDAP or editing Git hooks by hand. That was a big one. Yeah. Held up, man. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and, and so the next question is to you, Paul. Uh, I mean, you guys are still, I mean, going through this journey of adopting GitLab as another tool in, in your in your tool chain. I mean, what, what have been have been some of the challenges in the early days? Well, um, we're still very much in the testing phase. I mean, most of the stuff is still being, we're still using uh, uh, the old tools. Uh, I can foresee what, what problems are going to be because uh, uh, as the title of this panel uh, says, we're talking about organizations that are really uh, uh, massive in scale and in scope. Uh, I mean, oh, I have some figures here that I have had to, I've had to look up because they're uh, they're difficult to remember. But we have, for example, uh, we have something called KD identity, which gives access to things like Fabricator, the wiki, etc. And there are sixty-eight thousand five hundred accounts of that. And then of those, there are 2,646 developer accounts, uh, which are the people who can actually send code uh, by a, a fabricator or Git uh, from the command line or to Subversion. Yes, we still use Subversion. Sorry. <laughs> but really? We yeah. Sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there are, uh, so uh, I have another number here, which I was pretty, uh, let's see if I can find it. The number of, hmm, let's see, one sec. Uh, ah, yes, we have uh, uh, 2,450 official Git repositories in gitkd.org, and then there are 390 personal repositories of people who are developing stuff that don't want to make it uh, that, that are not ready to sort of like make them public out, uh, yet. Uh, so I think the the challenge is going to be big just because of the size of of yeah. moving stuff. Uh, and a lot of these people uh, are using arcane uh, uh, tools and that, you know, the typical developer <coughs> excuse for that is, well, it works for me. Uh, the problem is that that's not good enough because uh, in a community, you want to have more than one person working on on uh, each project because otherwise, if he, that person gets hit by a bus, then we have a problem. So uh, we have to somehow come up with uh, a, a good framework to to get all these things under control. It's been, as I say, it's been bit pretty chaotic up until now. Yeah, I mean, as these numbers like demonstrate, I mean, a lot of the open source projects, like especially with the number of contributors and projects, I mean, it very quickly starts looking like medium and large size businesses. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's the title. I think we have about six minutes left. I don't want to dominate, I monopolize all the questions. Like, do any of the audience members have any questions? Like, if you can raise your hand. If not, I can keep going. Uh, There we go. All right. Uh, I'm curious. I think Carlos mentioned uh, Baxilla a couple of times, and I think uh, obviously all of those projects are using Baxilla. Which is interesting because the scale of users you have is uh, uh, much, much more than any other uh, project you will usually have. Have you? ever considered uh, em em embracing GitLab's issue tracker for that as well? Is is that feasible at all? I mean, at least in Gnome, we are using the whole GitLab. Uh, 
yeah, like the issue tracker, the CI, everything yeah, that we use everything, is everything, everything, yeah. in GitLab. Like before we have Baxilla, Sigit, plenty of tools, like 10 tools or something like that, mm -hmm. and with plugins to make them work and all of that. Now, at least for now, everything is GitLab. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure for free desktop. Yeah, it, it's the same for us. Um, we're just waiting for, there's a couple of kernel graphics drivers that um, need to migrate. Everything else is on um, bug, uh, GitLab issues. And so hopefully next week I get to permanently turn Bugzilla into a read-only archive, and I'm so happy about that. <laughs> Other questions? I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering that historically a lot of open source infra was like old and unmaintained. That like, how much are you going to be keeping track with like the master or the releases or like, uh, oh, like basically how often are you going to be updating your instances of GitLab? Uh, updating our instances? Uh, how, how regular are you going to update uh, the instance of GitLab? Uh, do I understand the question correctly that you said uh, how regularly we are going to update yeah. uh, the GitLab instance? Yeah. So <laughs> for now it's daily. Yeah. We literally do it daily. We use, uh, yeah, <laughs> we use open, OpenShift, uh, I think. And then we have some uh, cron job that is doing it updates every day. And that's, that's pretty good. And it's one of the calls that we had to always be updated because with Baxilla, sometimes we were four years old instance with security issues, uh, that's insane. That's insane. And so yeah, not with your lab. <laughs> it, it's not a coincidence that, uh, that uh, uh, no one decided to go to GitLab and then free desktop and then KD. We, I mean, a lot of people seem to think that we are, we are competing in some way, but we usually, we collaborate on these things and we see, say, okay, let's, well, okay, in this case we say, okay, let's see if no one crashes, <laughs> crashes and burns with this, but no, it didn't, so then we, then we said, okay, this will be fine, and uh, we, we read their wiki and we read their blog post and uh, basically we are following their, we are following their lead at the moment. Yeah, we're, so we're on Kubernetes rather than OpenShift um, for expedience, but yeah, we're, usually takes us about 12 hours to, to deploy um, a release. Most of, most of that is just waiting for a nice quiet time to, to pull it down and restart. But um, yeah, if you ever, like you were saying, if you ever need a, a bugzilla to GitLab issue migration script, um, Gnome had a really good one, which I absolutely butchered for um, <laughs> our, our bugzilla's subtly different for some reason somehow. Um, but yeah, we, we do share a lot of the, the infrastructure and uh, some of the tooling around it as well. Any other questions from the audience? One more over here. How much um, pre-thinking did you do about the group setups and how, what was a project, what was a sort of group with projects under it from your sort of having that historic background? Um, this is definitely going to be different for all of us. Like GNOME's a, a much more coherent organization. Um, for Free Desktop, we've got a process to go through um, where people request a, a specific top-level group. They can't they can't create new ones. It's admin only. Um, once they've got the top-level group, they're free to to do anything with that. You know, barring like code of conduct violation <laughs> or something massively illegal. Um, but yeah, I guess for you guys, it's a very different answer, right? Yeah, I, like I personally wanted to go, uh, like to give the least, perm the least permission as possible, and then you know, uh, grab more if if there is a need. So actually, no, we didn't. So now we have a group which is known. Uh, everyone has developer permissions there, and we have the projects there. But you cannot create new projects. So now, the good thing is that we have personal repositories, so people can uh, have them, and then we have another group, uh, which is like uh, random projects that we have. They request me uh, to add a new project, and I add, the, add there. And so that's how we split it. We are pretty organized in that way, like pretty vertically organized in that way, uh, as opposed to free desktop, which is more like uh, yeah, a, a network of organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. It's a bit, it's a bit different. I can, I can tell you how it's done now, which is, which I guess we'll translate it into GitLab. Uh, if you, I mean, you can, anybody can apply for a, a KDE identity, which gives you access to things like uh, be able to work on the wiki or to uh, work on, on the, on the uh, task boards or whatever, but you cannot actually change any code for that. You need a developer account and to do that, you have to request it from uh, the system working group. The system work, and you have to have another developer vouch for you that you are reliable, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and that's how you get to become, uh, to get a developer account. As for um, how the projects are classified, we have uh, projects that are, that are private, that haven't become public yet for the rest of the community. Then we have an incubator, and then uh, once they have been stabilized and seen to be useful and maintained, etc., then they become uh, an official KDE application. I imagine that that will be the process that will be also translated to GitLab. Cool. It looks like we're out of time. Uh, thank you, audience member, for your questions, and thank you, panelists. And uh, we'll we'll be around. I think like the rest of the afternoon at the party as well. So come talk to us if you have any questions. <laughs>